Hey everyone, it's Norm Farrar, aka The Beard Guy here, and welcome to another Lunch with Norm, The Rise of the Microbrands. Lunch with Norm. Lunch with Norm. Lunch with Norm. All right, so today's guest is e-commerce expert, coach, and host of AMPM podcast, Tim Jordan. Uh, Tim and I are going to be discussing strategies on getting ahead this uh, for fourth quarter. So before I introduce Tim, we're broadcasting to you live on Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn. If you're watching this on my replay, if you're watching this on a replay, just skip ahead. And for those you, of you watching on my profile page, you can always head over to the fan page, Norm Ferrar, a.k.a. The Beard Guy, and watch the whole episode, uh, highlights, and content. So where are you, Kelsey? Hello. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Canadian Thanksgiving. Yes. How are you? All right. All right. So if you're joining us today, you can follow us on social media, uh, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Any of the videos that you see here will be directly uploaded to YouTube. Uh, you can find all the short clips uh, and full episodes. And if you're watching right now, you can hit that like and share button and smash it. Ring that bell. Um, and we are an official podcast, so you can find us on uh, Spotify, Apple Music, uh, podcast being anywhere you listen to podcasts, you can find Lunch with Norm. And I think that's it. We got, oh, Marina. Happy Thanksgiving, Marina. Hey, Marina. All right. And let us know where you're watching from today. Um, are you celebrating Thanksgiving today? Are you in the U.S., Malaysia? We'd love to know. All right. And I think Perfect. That's it. Okay, so if you have any questions, just put them over in the con comment box and we'll get to them throughout the show or we'll make sure that they get answered after the show. So sit back, relax, grab a cup of coffee and enjoy the show. So welcome, Mr. Jordan. I have my cup of coffee, just like you said. There you go. But do you have a beard guy cup of coffee? I don't have a beard guy cup of coffee. I'll send you one. <laughs> um, I do want to know, like in your little, uh, when the music kicked on and it showed kind of your logo with the beard, there was a fork and a knife like embedded into your beard. Yeah, that happens sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. I was wondering, is this like indicative of what happens at, at, at meal time at Norm's house? Occasionally stuff gets just lost yeah. in there. <laughs> hey, sometimes I find small children. It's... Uh... <laughs> It's, it reminds me of that Family Guy commercial, you know, when uh, Peter Griffin grew that big long beard out and he had the birds living in his beard. Oh yeah, <laughs> Did you yeah, ever see that right. one? Yeah. Oh man, I feel like that sometimes. <laughs> and you tripped me out when you said Happy Thanksgiving because I'm like, are we already <laughs> are we already a month and a half early? Like, is Q4 really flying by that fast? And that quick? <laughs> I know. No, it's it's our Thanksgiving. Uh, we already had our our meal yesterday, but oh boy. Yeah, I think the turkey's still kicked in. It's just oh. yep. And today in the U.S. is uh, Columbus Day, right? Which is an interesting holiday because many Americans are refusing to celebrate and honor it now. And I made a uh, Facebook post yesterday that actually got a lot of people fired up one way or the other. But the holiday was instituted to con commemorate Christopher Columbus discovering America. Okay. Well, I, I don't believe Christopher Columbus discovered America. You know, there was thousands of indigenous tribes here with pretty advanced societies long before he showed up. Um, so now I'm starting to hear, and I even heard on the radio this morning, people, uh oh, I missed out. But instead of calling it Columbus Day, calling it Indigenous People's Day. So while it's your Thanksgiving in Canada, we have no idea what holiday it is in the U.S. today. <laughs> All right. Well, how, how about Canadian Thanksgiving? How's that? Happy. It works for me. Yeah. All right. Perfect. <laughs> all right. Hey, we're going to be talking. A lot of people are talking about fourth quarter, but I was just wondering, uh, you know, you got any general thoughts? I, I know this is going to be a nutty fourth quarter because of how everything's happening right now. I feel like in general, and, and we could talk about micro practices, but in general, um, there's nothing you're going to do differently that you haven't already started preparing for that's going to change Q4. Like, this is one of those hold on for the ride and let's see what happens because so many things are happening that we can't anticipate what those are going to be. So whether it's the logistics issues that are going on, which we can talk about, 
whether it's you know Amazon really firing off this Prime Day plus Q4 plus um, you know all these other incentive uh, for buyers holidays they have buyer holidays and then we have to look at things like what retail stores are doing to adjust you know some of the big retail stores that people used to buy it are saying we're not opening up the evening of Thanksgiving like we used to and maybe um, you know Black Friday we're only gonna allow a quarter occupancy uh, blend all that into we know this is gonna be a huge um, demand you know the demand for e-commerce is gonna be huge this year like we've never seen before mixed in with that thing that I mentioned earlier like we can't get stuff inbound to FBA and we need to have some third-party logistics so I will say this, that, you know, throughout this episode, I'm sure we're going to talk about a lot of things, but just understand that e-commerce is one of those games where you have to slow down to speed up. You have to measure twice, cut once. Like you can't be ultra reactionary or you might screw something up. And right now, you know, we're in the boat, the boat's in the ocean, the waves are kicking up all around us. Like maybe we can throw out a couple extra fishing lines, but we're not going to drastically change our situation. This is going to be like a hold on um, hold on for the ride, don't get thrown overboard, and let's just try to like keep calm and carry on this Q4. Yeah, we've talked about this on the podcast before, but uh, I think Q4 is going to be just, it's all about inventory and how you manage it, isn't it? Yeah, and unfortunately, the way that we manage it now is going to be very, hey, it's Tammy from Cold Lake, Canada. I, sorry, I saw her name back pop up. Um, I've got some stories about her if you ever want to hear anything really embarrassing. Um, I'm just kidding, Tammy. Kind of. But um, normally, you know, in Q4, you know, getting inventory in is a big deal. We have to do that. But we could rely on infrastructure that we can't rely on this year. You know, we know what's going on with the Amazon FBA. And this year, there's been a huge surge for people to begin using third-party logistics services which most of right now are not even accepting new clients. They're completely full. So it's like, even though we know what one of the problems is and we know what some of the solutions should be, we can't necessarily access those solutions, right? So I know people that are unloading containers in, you know, 40 foot containers at their house and unloading, you know, pallets and pallets and pallets in the garage. And they've never done that before. You know, they've been selling for five years. So it's, uh, it's definitely a crazy year logistically for sure. Right. And probably one of the most important things that people can do is, is definitely make sure that you have the FBA and FBM uh, listing turned on. So oh, we never had to really do that before. You know, it's it's this year that's been kind of crazy. The other thing, Tim, do you have any tips or suggestions on how you can avoid those three week, four week uh, receiving into Amazon? You know, is I so I haven't necessarily figured out anything great, but what I have been doing is I've been uh, you know like I've got a mastermind program and I you know watch the Facebook groups and all that stuff, <laughs> Tammy, and um, <laughs> I follow along with where people say, hey, my stuff just got checked into Juliet, Illinois, or my stuff just got checked into Memphis faster, and instead of hauling my stuff all the way to Dallas or you know Charleston or something like that. I have begun in a few occasions using inventory placement, which is expensive, right? Because they're going to charge me per unit. I think it's 30 cents by getting to pick and choose which fulfillment center that I go to. I have had a little luck on some high priced items where I really needed those in FBA because it's super competitive just to sink the money and send it in. But the problem is I'm going off of information that's a little bit subjective. You know, I'm making these decisions. I'm going to ship to Memphis. I'm going to ship to Juliet based on what I saw in a Facebook group where someone said, oh, my stuff got checked in quick. So it's not an exact science. Do is, is try to send it places where other people are getting faster turnarounds. So let's talk about inventory placement for a second. For those of us that don't know where to find that, how do you, how do you uh, go about using inventory placement? Yeah, it's just an option within your, uh, basically your inbound shipping settings. And what you're doing is telling Amazon, hey, this is where I'm going to go. Now, the only other time that I've used that with success, especially with like large oversized items where um, it's like one unit per carton, right? So if I'm selling something huge, there's not a carton carton. I don't have a carton of 50 units. I used to be able to say a pallet was 50 units and the pallet itself was a carton, but Amazon slapped me on the wrist for that. <laughs> so if it's a $120 oversized item, I'll pay the 30 cents so that I can ship everything into one fulfillment center as opposed to them saying we'll send 10 here 20 here 50 here 40 here 
because if I can consolidate those into four or five pallets and ship them directly in, it saves me a mountain on the inbound, um, and it completely negates that thirty cents per unit. Nice. So it's not something that many people use, uh, but it's definitely a tool out there for a few scenarios like this Q4 maybe, or super oversized items. Okay, fantastic, great point, uh, Kelsey. Let's go through a few shout outs here. Yeah, for sure. We got tons. We got lots of people joining us. Uh, so Lisa Kinski is joining us saying happy birthday or uh, happy Thanksgiving. Sorry. Uh, happy birthday, Canada. <laughs> yes. Happy birthday. <laughs> uh, Nathan is back uh, from San Diego. San Diego. Alan. Uh, hello, Alan. Welcome hey, Alan. Norm, have you ever met Alan? I, I don't think we've ever met, but... You've uh, seen his name pop up, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Alan, Alan is one of the most interesting and funny guys I've ever met in my life. I can tell you some stories about Alan. He's a professional thief, <laughs> and um, he's gotten me in trouble at one of the most premier athletic clubs in the world. I can tell you about that. In oh, really? All right. Okay. Yeah, well, he, didn't, he, didn't tell me, he didn't tell me. He invited me to lunch at this place and didn't tell me you have to wear long pants. So I walk up into the Singapore Cricket Club, which is like one of the most exclusive sporting clubs out there, and they met me at the door because I was wearing shorts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We also got uh, Simon joining oh, us. Oh, Simon's back. Yeah. Michelle from New Jersey. Uh, hey, Michelle. Tammy. Um, Tammy. Let's see. Uh, Trong. I, th- I believe that's how you say his name. I'm not quite sure. Uh, Faye. Faye has a question for us later on. But, um, okay. Sure. Leonard. Leonard's here. Tony, oh, right? Alan, Paul. Tony was just on the podcast last week. Paul was on the podcast a couple weeks ago. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, a whole bunch of people joining us. And if you guys want to jump into questions, just let me know. We already have like three or four. But oh, fantastic. Okay, yeah. so uh, let's see. Why don't we? Uh, why don't we take one of the questions before we move on? All right. Perfect. Let's see who is the first. Uh, we have. Oh, this was just about your uh, helium ten presentation uh i know you have a you gave a killer presentation on h10 uh elite about amz posts but i can't find it which month was it oh i think it was last i think it was last month okay yeah uh, it, was, right. it, was la- it was last month yep okay so uh so from tony happy thanksgiving guys at least for the canadians i have a good one my question is if you guys started using the helium 10 advertising ppc tool i haven't tim have you no, and man, the, the folks at Helium 10 might kill me for saying this, but I'm, I'm just going to say it because I call it like it is. Helium 10 has... I, and those of you listening, at Helium, Bradley, Cassandra, if you're listening, let me finish my comment. <laughs> um, when Helium 10 first launched their ads tool, their PPC tool, it was rough, right? And it's not because Helium 10 doesn't know what they're doing, but it is incredibly difficult to automate PPC. Even the biggest companies like Tika Metrics and... Um, a quartile, you know, they're good for some functions, not good for others. So just inherently, it's tough to automate PPC, right? But I will say one thing that Helium 10 has done is they have now purchased uh, PrestoZone. They yeah, launched Presto this uh, like two weeks ago, PrestoZone, which is um, apparently some really good software for some things. And they're integrating those features into the Helium 10 ad suite. So even if, you know, you're asking, hey, how is it? And, and I personally haven't used it. But if you see some bad reviews about it, give it another month or so because they are blending these these uh, you know existing softwares into the softwares that they've acquired, and I think it's going to continue to get better and better. So it's kind of an ongoing process. Yeah, and Victor is going to be on the podcast. I think in about a month. Um, I think we just confirmed him coming on. So yeah, stay tuned for that and get your questions ready. I, I agree with you, Tim. It's just a matter of time to build it out. Okay, so let's talk about the most important thing. If there's a single thing a seller has to do, what would that be for Q4? It depends on when you ask me. If you ask me right now, yep. my answer is different than three months ago. Three months ago, I would have said, get a bunch of inventory, get that stuff ranked and ready. Right now, I feel like Q4, one of the secrets is going to be not having shiny object syndrome and waiting mm. for things to sell and here's the scenario prime day we're already getting blown up by amazon oh run lightning deals run daily deals run these things exclusive offers hey we suggest you jack up your ppc by 200 percent all this stuff well the only person that benefits from that is the customers and amazon we don't really benefit from that because think about think about what's going to happen this q4 
we've talked about inventory problems, right? Everybody's got inventory problems. We've also talked about all these promotions being run at once. And we see everybody saying, oh, push, 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 sell your stuff cheaper, cheaper, cheaper. But I don't know about you guys, but most years I end up like selling out inventory in Q4 already. So one thing that, that I feel certain about this year to, to capitalize on the inventory you already have, because it, it's too late to get more inventory generally, is ignore all the hype, ignore all the promotions, ignore all the discounts, ignore all the coupons, don't raise your PPC, But because I think what's gonna happen is, everybody's gonna run out of stuff, all your competitors are. Everybody's gonna blow out. So if I have 2,000 units or something, and Prime Day, which is tomorrow, I run a big promotion, what's the point of blowing through, you know, half of my inventory at a discounted rate? Right. When I'm probably gonna sell it out by Christmas at an elevated rate. Right? Same with PPC. Everybody says, well, jack up your PPC, jack up your PPC for Prime Day. What I've always noticed is that everybody runs out of the daily budget. They'll go from $1 a bid to $3 a bid, and they'll go from a $20 a day budget to a $30 a day budget, and they burn out by 11 and then their ads stop. Well, guess who gets the ad next? Me, still bidding $1 a bid. Or if you've seen the data about when purchases happen in e-commerce, in most time zones, it happens between like 3 p.m. and 9 p.m. So everybody blows through their PPC budget super early. So my point is when you think, you know, we've got two and a half months before Christmas, whether it's FBA, FBM, it doesn't matter. People are going to probably buy your stuff. And I don't want to blow out my stuff at a discounted right now and, you know, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, when I could be the only competitor in my niches selling for double the price in December. So that gives me more inventory stability Remember how important that is. Inventory stability, that inventory performance index. If I blow out all my stuff and I'm out of stock till the end of January, that's not gonna help my inventory. But even if I'm not selling super fast, I'm selling consistently, but I keep my inventory in, that's good. Um, also think about just the branding and the placement. People are gonna see your products. People are gonna notice your brand more as they search. Uh, people are gonna be retargeted with Amazon, PPC ads even off Amazon, as long as you're in stock and you have the buy box. So ride this sucker out. And when you notice your competitors start going and your sales start moving, um, understand that you're selling at a higher profit margin than you would be if you went through all that glitz and glam. Yeah, that's a that's exactly what we do. Um, we, yeah, tired of blowing our budgets and wasting time with that. I I, I think it was um, first time I heard it was Brian Johnson said that uh, he used a um, uh, a cascading effect. But uh, one of the, the takeaways I got was just wait. Hold on, uh, and then at the end of the day, you know, or towards the end of the day, now you start hitting them, and yep. you're going to sell it anyway. So, do you want to sell it at 30% off uh, and make no money, or stay steady and make the full sale? Because if I have a plastic shoe stretcher that is everybody else has run out of inventory, and I still have that plastic shoe stretcher, I can sell it at the same rate, or I can even bump up the price a little. Yeah, and I will say this. I see a few questions about um, running out of stock and, and pricing stuff. For one, yes, I think it's Simon just asked, you know, if, if I keep in stock and I'm selling a consistent rate, I'm the champion in Q1, absolutely. Even when a lot of these people come back into stock, um, they're going to have a harder time trying to catch back up to your stability because remember ranking right now is not all about the tricks and the, and the you know, black hat stuff and the fads. Amazon has essentially wiped away most of that. I still know of some stuff going on and some stuff that works, but generally speaking, the thing that will con will keep your ranking higher for a search term is a high degree of conversions, consistent sales, consistent inventory, right? So think about that thing, what I just said, con um, consistent conversion rate. Be careful, I know Paul's talking about he'll jack his price up on Prime Day and still sell out. Prime Day, maybe, but what I don't like to see people doing in Q4 is especially if they know, hey, at my current run, I'm going to stock out December. So what a lot of people will think is, hey, I'm going to increase my price by 20%, which will slow me down, and then I'll stock out on December 20th. So you're only getting a few more days in there, but you're starting to slow your conversion rate and slow your velocity. So when you do come back in stock, Amazon is pinpointing your current location. I like, I, I did a YouTube video recently where I'm talking about, it's like, if you're going to drive your car off a cliff, I'd rather mash the gas and drive it off faster, right? So I don't intentionally slow down sales before I'm going to go out of stock for an extended period of time. Sometimes I'll even lower my price a hair, up my PPC a hair, 
just to get that conversion rate and get that um, velocity up just a tiny bit. And it might I might stock out one or two days earlier, but now I'm at a little bit higher place to stock out so that when I do come back in, my placement should also be a little bit higher. Right. Yeah. Hundred percent. So, agree yeah. So don't that. try to stretch it out, or you'll just tank your you'll tank your uh, rankings. Right. Kels, any other questions? Yeah, uh, so Alan has one. Uh, so I'm currently shipping to a 3PL a new range of products and have yet to create my FBM listings. Are there any key points I need to take into consideration when uh, creating these listings? Well, I'll start with one, then I'm going to let you do one. Um, sure. Typically, Amazon is dirt cheap for fulfillment. I mean, nobody can beat FBA rates for fulfillment. So if you go to FBM, it's just going to cost you more, and your profit margin is going to be a little bit less. One thing I like to do is, you know, as long as I'm still profitable, I'll keep the listing price the same, okay? And the reason is, if I'm going in and out of FBA, FBM, FBA, FBM, the price fluctuates consistently, which can jack up a lot of things. Sometimes I've even seen people jack up their price for the merchant fulfilled listing so much that they'll lose their own buy box, which is good because now your listing gets all jacked up, your ranking and all that stuff. So as long as I am making 30% here and 20% with FBM, instead of trying to raise my FBM price, I'll keep the, the buy box price the same. No, I'm not making quite as much money with the ful fulfilled by merchant option, but at least my listing is consistent. Because remember, we're playing long ball. We're playing the long game. And we want that price consistency because if you raise that price, your conversions will start to drop too, and then your rankings can be affected. Right. The only time that I would change that is if they wanted expedited shipping. If yep. they wanted expedited shipping, I charge a bit more. I, I guess we're listening to the uh, the same Amazon experts because I, that's exactly what I would do as well. You you want to make it simple. You want to make it. Um, you you don't want to. Um, I mean, it's already people are if they're going over to FBM. Uh, there was a concern more. Uh, in the past than it is now, but it was FBM. People trust Prime. Uh, FBM was no, always known for um, extra charges and long uh, turnaround times. But uh, yeah, you also want to make sure that you set it up properly. And uh, Kevin was on, he was talking about uh, Kevin King the other day, and he was just talking about doing it properly. Um, people would set up a, an absolute separate listing where it's so simple to go into your FBA listing uh, in inventory management, go over to edit, uh, or not over to edit, but add a condition. And then it's very easy to create an FBM listing. It just gets imported over. And then when you run out of uh, FBA, it can flip over to FBM. So that's something. Um, the other thing that... Um, uh, Kevin and I were talking about is changing from going to UPS and asking them to do um, ground with freight services or freight pricing. And that seems to be bringing like FBM listings into Amazon a lot quicker than if you're doing it the other way. So uh, you can still get three day receiving in, in Amazon for the most part. So anyways, that's all I have for that. Okay. All right. So we'll jump into another one uh, from Leonard. Uh, I recently launched a product and want to create a few more campaign and ads off Amazon. Should I wait until after Prime Day to do this or just go ahead now anyway? And Leonard, this may be one that I actually want to address uh, on our group call today um, in the Centurion League. But here's my opinion is there's going to be so much traffic with Prime Day even Amazon running ads on other platforms. So Amazon will run ads on Google. Amazon will run ads on Pinterest. If you were just starting something in Prime Days over the next couple days, I wouldn't do any off Amazon advertising because the data you get is going to be so jacked up. So even if you get a few sales, you're not going to know what you're looking at. The, the cost per click is going to be super elevated. The conversion rate is probably going to be low because so many people are poking around but probably going you know, and, and, and not necessarily purchasing, you're just shopping and just, you know, checking, you know, that's what I do is tomorrow morning, I'll wake up and I'll spend two hours just seeing what everybody else is selling, but I won't buy anything. Wait. I would wait a couple days before I started doing that. But you know, you know what you're going to do off, uh, off Amazon. I think your, your strategy is going to be good, but I would definitely wait until after prime day. And I wouldn't change anything around cyber Monday, black Friday. Right, because everybody's going to be out spending you. You know, even Walmart online, they're going to turn their giant cannons and start lobbing millions of dollars of Google ads out that day. Mm -hmm. We can't touch that. I wouldn't adjust anything. I would just keep status quo, 
let it ride and see what happens. Something you can do off Amazon too. It's too late for Prime Day, but going into Black Friday, uh, it's a different story. And that is um, promoting your own website. So promoting, if you're selling on Shopify, if you have another e-commerce platform, uh, you do a pre-Prime Day sale or pre-Black Friday sale, and then you can carry that right over to Black Friday. Here's a, a, a bit of a trick that you can do. So you, add to a, you do a, a, an added value campaign where it's a product that you can't get on Amazon. So they want it. They already have been driven over to your website. So they want your shampoo with a free bottle of conditioner, whatever it is. But then you give them a coupon to go back over to Amazon on Prime Day or Black Friday and buy your product at 10% off or whatever. And that's just another way to get two sales instead of one. I like it. There you go. But when's the last time you bought shampoo and conditioner, Norm? Well, the beard. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I thought that was bar soap and beard oil. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, Kels, I see there's a bunch of comments and questions. I can't. Yeah. Tim, the reason is I have this so small, I can't read the bloody thing, even even with my glasses. So Kelsey's got to read them for us. It's my main job. At, uh, <laughs> um, okay, so actually, wow. Uh, Wendy is joining us from Sydney, Australia. Wow. And it's it's late there. Over there. Um, and we have Faye saying, thanks again for such an amazing and awesome podcast. Thank it's you. All, about our yeah. all right. Tony has one. Uh, should I adopt keywords, which is, uh, it's monthly search volume are under the 100 to put into PPC campaign. So for me, I love those keywords. I love the keywords that have a hundred here, 500 here, 400 here. Cause most people aren't focusing on those. I can rank for them easily. The problem is if you try to load up Amazon with too many keywords to run campaigns on, it starts missing, it starts screwing up, you start having problems, right? Um, you know, on most campaigns, like a, like a whole campaign, I won't do any more than about 15 keywords because I notice my impressions start getting wonkier, they drop out, right? So what I've been doing recently, which seems to work, after I've gone through, this isn't for like a test campaign that I sometimes do, and it's not for a launch campaign, because launch campaign, I'm usually targeting like 10 keywords that have 1,000 to 3,000. That's kind of like, for me, my magic number to launch. <coughs> and eventually, I'll start working my way up, <coughs> excuse me, to the higher volume ones. But but initially starting, I want the high conversion rate, low competition. So I'll shoot that 1,000 to 3,000, 8 to 12 keywords. Later on, maybe two or three months after my launch, Oh, and by the way, if you do your job right, those super long tail with 100, you'll start indexing for pretty easily, I've noticed. But maybe a month or two or three months into my campaign, I'll actually turn on an auto campaign to start capturing those 100 searches per month, right? So I'll run an auto campaign, I'll negative out all my exact key, um, keywords, and I'll run uh, a, an auto campaign for half the price per click than I am in my manual campaigns. And it usually picks up those 100, 90, 300, 400 very, very, very well. And I don't have to worry about trying to manage all those physically. Now, what I will do every two or three weeks is pull that report and see which one of those has a high conversion rate, which may have more impressions than I expected. So if you look at a keyword and you say, oh, it only has 100 searches per month, but you let an auto campaign run for 30 days and it's targeting that keyword and you see, well, you had 3,000 impressions, you start scratching your head, go, why with 100 searches a month do I have 3,000 impressions? Well, maybe the search tools weren't accurate or maybe there are people coming back over and over and over again, so I'll look at it too. But usually the real small ones I'll capture with an auto campaign. Right. We, um, we do that with rebates. So we'll just create silos of, we call them uh, the primary keywords, which are a longer tail keyword and then longer tail keywords. So nat uh, natural bully stick or odorless bully sticks and six inch odorless bully stick, grass fed natural odorless. And we'll see, and they can be under a hundred. They could be, usually they could range between four, uh, 400 and down or 700 and down. And also it depends on your niche. But what we'll find is over time, especially with rebates, that if you're, uh, let's say you're targeting that word odorless bully stick that might have 4,000 impressions, but you're using all these long tails. Now you're starting to climb your, the ranking on uh, odorless bully sticks start to climb as well as you're targeting these long tails with the rebates. It's crazy. So, and I don't know if you've seen that Tim, but like if you've got something, I know I did this with chef knife. So you had to, uh, it I forget how many it was like, uh, 
70,000 searches or something like that. So we did a long tail with it. And all we had to do is instead of giving away a thousand chef knives, we gave away 150 chef knives, all long tail, and they started just to climb. We actually were ranking uh, in the top 10 for chef knife. We got up to about uh, number three, I think. And uh, it, it, it stuck there with maintenance, like just giving away a few rebates with press releases. It just stuck. So and we think about what I said about the reason things rank high is because of conversion rates. So if I'm selling a chef knife, mm -hmm. well, there's a million different chef knives out there. People want sets. People want, you know, the um, Damascus steel. People want ceramic. People want a 10 inch or a 12 inch or a 9 inch or an 8. Like it's it's crazy, right? Do they want wood handle? They want plastic handle. They want silicone handle. They want it. But when so if if so if I run PPC for a chef knife and I'm showing it to everybody essentially, you know, first PPC position that it's typing chef knife, I'm not relevant to everybody. Because even if I have the coolest Damascus steel chef knife for $60, that's not what people are looking for. So to your point, I don't even target chef knife. I target nine inch Damascus steel chef knife, Damascus steel chef knife, um, Damascus steel, steel kitchen gift, these long tail keywords. And now the people that are seeing that ad, I know exactly what they're looking for. So my mm -hmm. relevancy is so high that my conversion rate becomes high my click-through rate and my conversion rate. So although I'm targeting several keywords and I'm trying independently, this one has high conversion click-through, this one has high conversion click-through, this one has high conversion click-through, the product is, as an overall is racking up a high percentage of click-through rates and conversion rates, right? So now that data is looked at for every keyword that Amazon is indexing, including chef knife. So Amazon is identifying, hey, this is a chef knife with high conversion rate high click-through rate, but I did it by targeting the ones that I knew would have the higher rates because of a higher degree of relevancy. And it gives me the bonus up here at the top for that that kind of castle keyword, I call it, that that short tail, super uh, high search volume. Right, do you ever um, use those types of keywords with Amazon Posts? Amazon Post. Yeah, when you're, when it, do you uh, work with Amazon Posts at all? Mm -mm. No, okay. Um, just. I was I'm looking at you like, what are you talking about, Norm? <laughs> so, yeah, we, we, we spend a bit of time with Amazon posts. And one of the things that we're looking at now is taking those long tails and actually putting, putting them in the caption. And the other little trick, um, if, at the, if you're going into at least three out of the four Amazon posts that you can do, um, you get, you'll see categories. And then you can start going into each one of those categories and targeting those keywords. I have no idea if they're indexing. I'm just experimenting with that right now. But when we're looking at, and this is like fourth quarter, if you're doing a launch or if you're doing maintenance, PPC uh, rebates and press releases and Amazon posts. And um, Carlos, our buddy Carlos Alvarez, uh, big on Amazon Live. So those are a few things that, um, uh, those are the four pillars of our, success with launch or maintenance yep is that a yeah you you kind of agree with me or nah kind of i mean i, I know so little about posts i don't really want to give too much of an opinion you know <laughs> just smile and wave tim <laughs> i thought you would say smile and look pretty i'm out on that i can smile i can't do the other one <laughs> All right, we have uh, Paul giving some insight on the post oh, Mr. too. Paul. Uh, he says we get an, on average 2,000 monthly visits to our listings from our comp uh, competitors' listings um, from Amazon Posts. Wow. That's yep. Paul just making stuff up, though. We don't actually know that that's accurate. <laughs> and uh, Yaro is joining us too. He says hi. And hi, he's Yaro. got a question. Um, let's see if I can find it. Just give me a second. Uh, do you believe in the fact that listing uh, release or uh, listing release date or launch date are important for your honeymoon start, or only the date when listing gets inbound inventory is important? Can I be controversial, Norm? Go ahead. I have two answers to that. Right. The first one is I don't put a whole lot of right. I know there's a lot of people that build these entire launch phases on the magical honeymoon period. And I think that it's been a little bit overhyped. 
Now, let me explain what I see see the honeymoon period is. If I'm launching a mason jar, okay, my water jar here. If I'm launching a mason jar and there's 10,000 listings that are indexing for mason jar, Amazon's not going to put me on page 3,241. They're going to give me some benefit of the doubt. They're going to say, okay, this guy, based on his listing, is indexing for mason jar or mason jar. We're going to start him on page 12. If I do a good, and, and that's just an arbitrary number, don't take that as gospel truth. They're going to start me somewhere that's not at the bottom. If I do well, I'll start rising. If I do poorly, I'll start falling. So basically, Amazon's giving you some benefit of the doubt. So if I take a listing, mason jar, and my listing sucks, and I'm always out of inventory, and my price is too high, and my conversion rate and my click through rate is just in the doghouse. Sometimes I'll pull all that stuff out and I'll start over. Because if after three months I've tanked it, I'm just losing ground from my initial starting starting period. So the honeymoon period, I don't see it as a time when you can magically rank, but I see it as a placement where you're giving some benefit of the doubt in which you can start gaining ground faster than losing it. So if I completely tank a listing, I may pull the inventory out, close that listing, delete it, put a new sticker on it, and start it over. But for me, um, I've also never seen anywhere where that honeymoon period is like 14 and a half days or 12 days. You know, like, like I just don't see that, right? Now, that being said, I have never seen anything be affected with launch date or release date necessarily as much as just the date that it goes is available, right? So when the product becomes available, when it becomes available, the buy box pops up, the listing pops up. That's when I think the countdown has started for Amazon to decide if you do well or do poorly. Now, one thing that I'll do within this honeymoon period that um, I've had some success with, other people not so much, but I've had success with it, is imagine the scenario where you ship in 500 units and you've got your PPC set up, you've got everything rock and rolling, and the first 10 units get checked in and they sell. And they sell out. Well, now your buy box disappears, the listing disappears, and then five more units checked in here, and then 10 more units, and then you're out of stock, and then 20 units check in, you're out of stock. So Amazon's looking at that listing, and you're in, out, in, out, in, out. And even though your listing has started, the first day you might sell five units when you should have sold 20, but Amazon didn't have it checked in. So a lot of times, I'll even intentionally suppress a listing by removing the main image from that listing. still seems to work pretty well for me. And Amazon will continue to distribute those products. So I'll keep the first image out until I see, you know, if I ship in 500 units, I'll make sure I have 90 or 100 units available, the rest in FC transfer. Then I'll click that image back in. The listing goes live. My PPC goes live. But as far as manipulating PPC period, or um, not PPC, honeymoon period, those are the only two things I do is if I've completely crashed a listing into the ground and I'm going to have to resurrect it from the dead, I'll start over to start in that, you know, kind of medium position. And I will make sure that when I initially start my conversion, my click-through rate's high, uh, my availability stays consistent by suppressing a listing until Amazon can distribute thing FBA. If it's FBM, it doesn't matter as much. Right. So I got a question. Would you, along those lines, if you had a product that you were going to launch a couple of days before Prime Day or a couple of days before Black Friday, would you? No. I don't right. see any reason yeah. for that because uh, you're going to launch this thing, right? And and what is an actual launch? What do you call that? Did you have all your inventory in place 20 days before, but you're going to start your PPC campaigns? You're going to start, you know, your big stuff on Prime Day, you know, your 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 giveaways or your big promotions. Well, it's going to get washed out because every Tom, Dick, and Harry selling Amazon is doing the same thing. Like you're just going to get caught up in the turbulence and gone, right? Right. Um, and I definitely wouldn't try to get my products landed three days before Prime because the inventory is going to be all over the place. You're not going to have consistent buyability or, or your listing even up because oh, your inventory is going to be all over. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, more questions. There's a ton of questions, I think. I can't read them. Too yeah, bad. yeah, we do. There's a, yeah, a ton that are coming in. Um, let me see. Don't want to miss anyone. Um, I saw uh, Dr. Cause. Hey Jordan. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll, we can do Dr. Kaz's question. Um, so, uh, when you start over, if a product got some bad luck re or reviews, do you copy that listing or really make a new listing? Any pros and cons, and how you actually restart, relaunch? There's not actually a playbook because every time is different. If I have a product that I know is a decent product, one star reviews, 
I'm not going to immediately tank it because if I have a thousand units and that's a pain in the butt to retract those. I'm going to see what happens. You know, maybe maybe it's just bad luck and I'll have to get over the hump and get them going. If I have, I've seen people that get so bent out of shape. I had six five star reviews and then a two star review, and it killed my sales. I and it was fake. Yeah, I don't necessarily. <laughs> yeah, it was fake. Well, one people. Sometimes your products just suck, right? Like you don't actually know it's fake. Don't accuse everybody of black hat stuff. Sometimes, sometimes either your product sucked or it broke, your listing wasn't accurate, or sometimes people are just a holes when they review your product. Let it go. But right now, people, consumers, are so sick of being lied to with reviews. That's why the U.S. government in the U.S. is stepping in and regulating reviews on consumer review websites because they want the whole picture. For me, if I look at a product that has 30 reviews and it's an average of four stars, fine, roll with it. There's going to be some turds out there, and I know that. I'm not going to worry about it. Don't take your listing. Now, I'll say this. If you launch something and you get six reviews immediately and they're all one or two star reviews, the problem isn't your reviews. This is not going to be an issue of pull my stuff out, relabel it, send it in, and try again. The issue is probably that your product sucks. Like You need to be thinking hard about quality control. Now, are there black hat negative review campaigns? Yes, there are. That stuff happens. But I bet it only happens 1% of the times people accuse it of happening. Right? Most people that are launching products, unless they're launching supplements or toys, you know, like those super competitive things where the black hat guys are going after you, most people aren't going after you. Like if I'm selling uh, a mason jar toothbrush holder that has 4,000 searches and I saw it on Pinterest, Man, there's nobody out there attacking me with negative review campaigns. It's, it's too small. Like Nobody's paying attention to those niches, right? So if I get three or four one-star reviews, I'm going to figure out, are my jars breaking? Like, what's the problem, you know? So it's not always a simple answer of like, oh, once I hit a certain number of bad reviews, I restart the listing. Sometimes I try to crawl back out of the hole because it's bad luck. But if they're legit bad reviews, I need to figure out why it's happening. Because if I just relaunch the product, it's probably going to happen again. Right. Are there any, uh, are there any, how do I say this? Are there the least important thing that people can think of that is important? Does that make sense? Absolutely what is not. I'm okay. so confused. What are you talking about? Oh, God. Okay. This happens all the time. All right. <laughs> is there somebody, like, it might be focusing on your reviews. It might be focusing on the question area, it might be on Amazon Post, but is the least important thing out there that people sometimes overlook, are there things that are important to be focusing on right now? Like maybe getting, adding questions or coupon stack or um, photos or back end, you know, putting up uh, keyword research yeah. or whatever. I, I think really simple things right now, and I'll go to the, the big things that people are overlooking. Simple things people are overlooking are videos, right? You don't have to have um, a trademark in, you know, you don't have to have brand registry to necessarily use videos. There's a way to use those. Even a year ago, you could have somebody leave a review video on any listing. Like, you can leave it on anybody's. People are overlooking that. I think that off Amazon traffic is being overlooked right now, and it can be super confusing, almost daunting, like almost um, scary, you know, like, oh my gosh, driving traffic to Amazon. And I'm not saying, I get misquoted all the time, people like say, Tim says drive all your traffic to Amazon. No, that's not what I'm saying. There are a lot of times you send into funnels and you capture audience, but um, man, sometimes if I'm launching something on Amazon, just a quick boost, I'll just drive some Pinterest traffic straight to Amazon because it's easier to convert and I have the higher buyer intent coming from Pinterest. I've since learned from Joe Reichsfeld that may not be the best thing to do. My point is, there are other places where you can drive traffic to that's inexpensive. If I go to Google, Google ads are getting pretty competitive because there's so many people uh, running them. What about Bing? Nobody talks about Bing ads. Well, Bing only accounts for 10% of the internet users, but they're the people that get a, a Microsoft Windows laptop, and that's the native browser. And they just don't know to change it, so they're using Bing, right? And those people might not be super internet savvy, so run some ads on Bing and drum straight to Amazon, get a little boost, right? So off Amazon traffic, um, use videos. Um, I can't really speak too much to like voice because a lot of stuff voice is enabled or, or we're still trying to figure that out. But the biggest thing that I think people are overlooking right now is not the nuances of tweaking your listing. And I see this all the time. People are like, man, if I could get my A cost down another 2%, man, my conversion rate needs a 1% tweak. Man, this, 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 this. And they're getting frustrated. Oh, I got one more, 
you know, three star review when I had 289 five star reviews and it's affected my life. I would say that the biggest problem that people are having and they're overlooking is just picking the, the right dang product to launch. Like people that are freaking out about, oh, well, if I could just get my PPC ACOS down another 2%, I'd be profitable. ACOS 2% difference will make you profitable? You're selling the wrong thing. Your margins are too low, right? Or people like get all upset about the, the, the duties. Oh, I thought the import duties were 15% and I found out they're 17.5%. Oh, no, I'm going to lose on this product. I'm not... Dude, if a 2% import duty crashed your profitability, you picked the wrong dang product, right? Do your homework first. Don't get emotionally attached to a product. Don't go out and decide, oh, I think mason jars are cool. I'm going to launch a mason jar toothbrush holder. Figure out what's in demand with low competition and launch that. Then your margin should be high enough that if your import duties change by 10%, who cares? If your A cost changes by 10%, who cares? You know, if you get one star review even at launch, but you're the only person that has this product listed on Amazon, who cares? People are still going to buy it. You'll eventually get those five-star reviews, right? So my little soapbox for the day. Quit Perfect. worrying about your 1% tweaks and start picking the right product. There you go. <laughs> All right, Kels, I think there's more questions here. Yep. So we got George Smith. Uh, I'm so surprised to find out that all the comp competitors in the first two pages are Chinese companies. Uh, who can compete with the, your own, su own supplier in China? I think Amazon models of business is no longer suitable or sustainable. What do you think? All right. Is it you that, or me that's going to, uh, this is perfect. <laughs> um, I think that you can start, and I'm going to get fired up to answer this too. You, you start, and then I'll uh, finish. Stop talking about the Amazon business model. And George, I'm not meaning to be critical to you, but like I've stood on stage, you know, with a thousand people and said, raise your hand if you're an Amazon seller. And everybody goes, and I'll say, quit being a dead gum Amazon seller. And everybody's like, you know, like we're supposed to do. I strongly encourage you to think of yourself as an e-commerce seller that uses Amazon or as a product seller that uses Amazon, right? So when I see a question like this, George, I know exactly what's in your head. And it's this typical model of that all the courses have taught. You go to Jungle Scout, you go to Alibaba, you buy this thing, you put your sticker on it, you bring it in and sell it. That business model is gone, and I would argue that it's almost always been gone. We were able to slip under the radar for a little while. I mean, like some of my old products, like these emergency hammers, that's exactly what I did. I sold them. But it wasn't a great model just because I had a year's worth of sales because then it tanked. It got too saturated. If you're building an e-commerce business where you have a product that's in demand with low competition, either you're one of the few people offering it and demand is, is higher than is supported by the current products available, or your branding is so good. People want your brand. People want your buyer experience. People want all that stuff. Then your Chinese suppliers are never going to be able to keep up, right? They're never. I can't tell you how many times I've had a Chinese competitor try to launch the same thing as me, and they can't do it because they don't know what PPC I'm running. They don't understand targeting keywords. They don't understand the buyer journey. They don't understand creating a brand. They don't understand any of that stuff. And eventually they give up. And for me, I usually try to sell products that fly under the radar. I don't have a single product that sells more than about 40 units a day, and I love it. If I have a product start selling 40, 50, 60, 70 units a day, I get nervous because now people are going to see that. And... The Chinese suppliers, Chinese, I'm not saying all Chinese products, but the ones you're talking about, the, the suppliers in China that are competing with you by basically taking your ideas, they're not interested in stuff that sells 30, 40 units a day because the only way they can compete is to drop the price so low that they have to have huge volume to make any money. So if I'm selling something 20 units a day, 30 units a day, they're not interested. They're probably not going to compete with me, right? It just doesn't happen. So again, it goes back to picking the right product. When you're picking the right product and you're not thinking of yourself as an Amazon seller, then the Chinese business model or the Amazon business model is not as much of an equation that you have to worry about. You know, I... Oh, hey, Joy. I think Joy the last time we met was in Iwu. Yeah, I haven't seen Joy. Ago. Joy, it's been a long time since I've seen you. Yeah, so, uh, okay, I want to go back to that, uh, George's question for a second because uh, I see this all the time. I get asked this all the time as well. Um, let the Chinese or whoever, if you, if you want to buy plastic shoe stretchers and they want to be 75 cents each or whatever it is, 
let the low priced bottom dwellers product cannibalize themselves. What you do, or at least what I advise is I always like perception. If I can do something different than the plastic shoe stretcher, I don't know, different color, different string, uh, spring, different whatever, um, make it more unique, spend money on the packaging, but even it's not so much as just being on Amazon. You want to build that brand. So be that brand, have a nice listing, have your your um, your e-com, like your Shopify site, build up some consistent looking um, social media and then start building content and content either through uh, PR. It could be videos. It could be uh, it, it could be a blog article. Now you're driving traffic over. And what's one of the first things that you do? I don't know about you, but when I see something new on Amazon, I go on to Google. Uh, my kids will say, I'll say the Google, but it, the, <laughs> Google. No, that's, that's the Facebook, not oh, the Google. Oh, the Facebook, not the Google. And I'll check it out. And if I'm consistent, guess what? I can get twice the price or three times the price. And it happens all the time. It's not that, like, let's say something's three ninety nine, and everybody's in around that price. I'll go up, if I can, to seven ninety nine. And I'll compete with the higher end uh, products. Sometimes you can't do it, but most of the time you, you can. And you're making more product. For those that want to compete on volume, that's one thing. But the people that want quality, and there's a lot of Amazon people that want quality, they'll buy my product. And don't get tied up in the sales volume fallacy. Like people think that they're losing on Amazon because they're selling a mason jar at $20 but the Chinese come in and they have, I'm just you know, throwing that out there as a, as a general generalization. The Chinese come in and they have a three pack for $20 and they're selling three times as many as me. Who cares if I'm profitable, I promise you I'm making way more money than, I, than they are with a third of the sales mm -hmm. because my profit margins are there. So don't get caught up in this fallacy of like, oh, they're selling more than me in volume, they're doing it better than me. That's not always the truth. Right. All right, Kels, next. All right. And just to let you know, we are at the 52 minute mark. Okay. Um, that went fast. Yeah, yeah, it really did. Okay. Uh, Alan has a question. Uh, as we are aware, there are significant delays with Amazon checking in our goods. Do you know if food products uh, take priority or are they treated the same as non food products? I don't know that. Tim? Uh, I don't know. I'll tell you what I, I'll tell you what I have noticed is many, especially perishables use different fulfillment centers, just like many super oversized things use different fulfillment centers. So I'm not sure that it's like my Mason jars and my protein bars are all getting shipped into DF one or DFW one. Is it? Yeah. Like, I don't know that the protein bars are going to take higher precedence. But if I have especially a perishable, it's going to go to a different fulfillment center, which is by nature faster, right? Because they have to get food in. So, Alan, I don't think that as a general statement, it's fair to say food gets checked in faster. I think pallets show up. But I will say that some fulfillment centers that aren't as bogged down with all the general merchandise will be faster by design for perishables, for hazmat, and for super oversized stuff. Right. Uh, next question. Yep. All right. Uh, let's do Tony's. Uh, after exploring a new potentially profitable keyword, uh, should I put it into a new campaign or leave it into an existing campaign, exact and broad? That's kind of like saying which color is best. It depends on who you ask. There's a lot of different ways to do it. For me, I think that it all comes down to organization. You know, I don't like to have a campaign with 50 keywords because I think Amazon just starts losing that and jacks it up. Um, but if I'm looking at a different keyword for a product, you know, hey, I want to add these three keywords that talk about something different, I'll usually set up a new campaign for my own organization. Like, hey, test campaign, you know, test dash drywall, you know, whatever that keyword is, just to help me uh, remember that. Because also if I put that keyword in a different campaign, my campaign metrics can get uh, skewed if like the conversion rate and sales rate and a cost is not high so just from a quick glance i like segmenting everything out so i can do a quick analysis of which groups of keywords are performing better than others and i don't necessarily know that it matters too much now we may have already touched on this but do you have any 
pricing optimization tips for the holidays. <laughs> no. By now, I've already priced the hound out of this thing. The, the moment you launch a product, you know what the price needs to be. You've researched the crap out of it. You know what your competitors are. You know what your profit margin needs to be. Pick a price and stick with it. You shouldn't meet, need to adjust anything. If, you know, all of my competitors, I'll jack that price up a little bit, 10% at a time, as long as I don't, you know, affect my sales velocity, I'll make a little bit more money. But I'm not going to jack up my price to slow down my sales intentionally for an out of stock like we talked about. Uh, or to eliminate an out-of-stock situation. So generally, I just keep it like it is. And go back and look at like your your Keepa or your Helium 10, you know, that graph on Helium 10 that shows you your sales consistency, and look at your big sellers. Your big sellers, they didn't jack their price up all over the place. You you opened it up to all time and look back to 2016. That sucker's been the same price forever. But they've sold a bazillion units of those things. I, I don't think that we need to make that many changes. I think that all it does is complicates our lives and it confuses Amazon because Amazon starts wondering what what the crap is going on to these people, and that's when you see stuff get re-indexed and you see stuff lose your own buy box and you see all sorts of craziness happen. Just leave it alone. Yeah, I do think though, when you are um, coming into holidays or if you're in a launch, you want to probably split, like do a split test on the the pricing and make sure that it is an optimal pricing for the listing. So, and that really comes down to, you know, the quality of the listing or the perceived value again. But um, yeah, you can use, uh, I was, I, at one point I used Splitly, but the other thing you can do is just go out to Usability Hub or PickFu and check out the price to make sure that it's at the right price. But if you're doing that, make sure you click the proper demographics. Uh, that's, yes. that's, yeah, crazy important. Yeah, so I don't think that, you know, I wouldn't say, hey, never adjust the price. To your, you know, what you said was during a launch. Yeah, during a launch, I'll keep it lower because I want that conversion rate, click-through rate super high. Mm -hmm. But if it's an existing listing moving into Christmas, I'm probably not, not going to adjust it just because I'm moving into Q4. Right. If it's brand new, I'll do some price adjustments for the launch. But if I've been selling it for 12 months, kind of leave it alone unless all my competition disappears and then I'll start creeping it up. Hey, Kels, is there any other questions for Q4? Uh, let me see. Uh, there's one. Or if anybody about, has any questions. There, yeah, there's still tons. Of them. Oh, are there? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if we're gonna be able to fit them in. Uh, but uh, does Prime Day see so much action in the UK EU? I am I'm, not. I'm sure. Sure. Yeah. I, I know about North American Prime Day. We should do that. We should. Um, we should. Take a study or, or get the uh, the numbers from. Let me just call Jeff Bezos real quick. Can you? <laughs> <laughs> hey All Jeff. Right. Hey Jeff Rowe. <laughs> <laughs> give me give me the deets on that UK Prime Day. All right, we'll jump into Nathan's question. Will Amazon customers actually pay more uh, for Made in America? I know people want Made in America, but they, are they willing to pay extra? It depends on the product. Mm -hmm. If it's a plastic shoe stretcher, nobody cares. Is it Honestly, cosmetics? If it's cosmetics, yes. If it's a mason jar, nobody cares. But if it's three mason jars made on a wooden stand that you hang on the wall to hold your cosmetics and toothbrushes, then maybe so. <clears throat> so is this a, uh, like is it cosmetics, ingestibles, consumables? Yes. Is this a luxury item? Yes. But if it's just a commodity, tchotchke, something, then no. So it's very, very much product dependent. Right. Okay. And we have Tony uh, from, well, he was on Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, Amazon is putting a major focus on the brands. What strategies do you have to optimize your Amazon storefront? How can we get traffic to the storefront organically instead of always using PPC? Here's how I would answer this, Tony. When you shop on Amazon, do you go to people's storefronts? Because I sure don't. The only time I go to the storefronts is to see <clears throat> what else they're selling researching them. <clears throat> I was um, at a meeting once with the guy from Rakuten, you know, the Japanese marketplace. And he was explaining the difference between Amazon and Rakuten. And Rakuten is a storefront platform. He was like, this is kind of like walking into a shopping mall. You walk down the aisle and you see the American Eagle store and you see the Hot Topic store and you see the... Um, you know, store, 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 and you know exactly what's in those storefronts. You have loyalty to those stores. But you walk into, or you log into Amazon, it's like walking into Walmart. 
you walk into different categories, but it's a hodgepodge of all sorts of brands of crap everywhere, right? And while I understand Amazon is having some success marketing brands, I'm not convinced they're going to have success driving people to storefronts because that's just not the way Amazon is. I don't go to Amazon and search Nike. I go and I search for Nike running shoe size 12. I don't care about the Nike storefront. I want to see what Nike running shoe size 12 there are in the list. The way it is, our intent is for a product, maybe a brand, but definitely not just a storefront. I'm not sure how much focus I'm going to put right now on the Amazon storefront because although it looks cool, I just don't think people are using it. Right now, I'm not at all saying products aren't or branding is not important. Look at we're talking about prices. Look at Tom shoes. It's a canvas shoe. I can buy it for four dollars at Walmart, but I'm more likely to go to Amazon and pay sixty bucks for it because the brand. So brands are important. But I'm just looking at Tom shoes. I'm not looking at the Tom shoe storefront. Right. So just my opinion, and maybe this will change like a lot of things do. And I'm sure some people have had success with it, but for me. I just don't think Amazon has designed and educated people well enough, buyers, to really utilize the storefront, so I'm not spending a ton of time on it. This is a, another area where you can drive people over to your um, your Shopify site, and you can display your brands there, or you dis yep. display your products there, have some sales, and then drive over to Amazon as well. And the beauty of doing that is your conversion rate. So if people have already seen something and they like what they're going to buy, chances of them buying it are, are very good um, another area where you can play around with it without actually going to your storefront Tony um, is in Amazon posts you can take these cross you can cross promote now, now that you can do multiple images so you can cross promote all these different products that you have and drive people over from your competitors page over to yours at least the impressions and if they go through the cycle the four clicks your conversion rate is definitely going to pop up. Okay, and we are past the one hour mark, so um, I'm not sure. There's two more questions, but if it's that's okay. Can we do the marathon too, Tim? Yeah, we can do two more. Okay. okay. All, All right, right. So Let's two more, and then we're done. That. Sure. All right. So I'll do this one from Yara. Uh, do American customers appreciate made in Germany? I think for certain products yet, I think mm -hmm. European made is fine. I mean, I want Italian leather, right? I want Swiss watches, you know, I think for sure. Okay. Yep. And our last one from Dr. Cause. Hey, Jordan, if you're selling fast and know you're going out of stock, what is the reason not to jack up the price to slow sales? Yeah, and we mentioned this earlier, so you can get more of a lengthy uh, explanation if you watch the replay this earlier on. But if you jack up the price to save a few more days, of stock of being in stock by jacking up the price you will decrease your conversion rate and decrease your click-through rate so when you do run out of stock your placeholder essentially in your page positioning will be lower than if you just let it run out and Amazon is doing a pretty good job maintaining your spot they know if if I run out and I'm position four even if I restock two months later they're usually putting me on page one if I slow down in those last three days, I go from position four to position 14. When I restock, I'm probably going to be closer to 14. So I don't think it's worth it to be longer, but lower converting. Right. I did a really good YouTube video on that. If you want to see like my hand graph, go to the Private Label Legion or just Tim Jordan on YouTube, and there's a recent video where I drew out a kind of graphic of that. Yeah, some people uh, last week were asking about wood products. So I directed them over to your uh, your, your wood uh, your wood tips sourcing wood tips. <laughs> my <Sorry>. wood. <laughs> you directed my wood tips. I don't know. Just, Thanks, Norm. You know what? It's I told you turkey, <laughs> turkey. Too, too, much turkey, turkey. too much turkey. Too much coffee. <laughs> I sent them over to your YouTube video. Norm, I know we're good friends, but man, wood. you got to put a pause on some of that stuff. Again, I'm not turning red. <laughs> I love it. Oh man! But I Joy, did. Joy's there. if Joy Packard's on here, she's just shaking her head. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody is. <laughs> I know. Oh, All right, sir. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about other than wood tips? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's it's the same stuff we talked about at the beginning. 
Y'all get excited. Q4 is going to be huge. If you don't have a ton of inventory, if you're just getting started, write it off, but don't be discouraged because, look, this COVID thing sucks. I mean, 2020 mm -hmm. has just been a dumpster fire of a year. But the truth is, even when the, the actual pandemic is over, more people are going to be shopping online. So I still say there's never been a better time to uh, be an e-commerce seller. But don't be an Amazon seller. Be an e-commerce seller. Think long strategy. Don't think short-term You know, um, hacks. Don't be too reactionary. Every big decision you're going to make, sleep on it for a night or two. Um, keep calm and carry on. This is not a flash of the pan. This is going to be a long-term deal. But you don't want to drive yourself crazy making rapid decisions based on emotion uh, that may not be the best decision. So. All right. So how can people get a hold of you, Tim? Uh, Facebook. And if, guys, I, this is terrible. I'm Norm, you're the same way. I have like 1,500 message requests I've never read. But go to my Facebook group, Private Label Legion. Um, join that. I think there's 5,000 members or so in there now, and um, it's a good community. Uh, PrivateLabelLegion.com, and uh, I have a mastermind too called Centurion League. Uh, you can Google the Centurion League uh, mastermind. All right, very good. And of course, you're the host of oh, AMPM podcast. podcast. Yep. Yeah, and so AMPM wanna... is on every podcast platform, YouTube. Um, one episode every week drops. Uh, it's all good in the hood. Well, very good. All right, Tim. Well, thank you, sir, for joining us today. Really appreciate your time. Yep. Thank you for having us on, and um, thank you for doing this. I know you put in a lot of work to put this content out there, and you and Kelsey do. So thank you guys for uh, continuing to faithfully um, provide content for everybody. Hey, you're very welcome, and we got to have you back on. Sounds good. All right, sir. We will talk to you soon. All right, everybody. So I hope you enjoyed this podcast today. Uh, as we mentioned at the beginning, this whole episode will be on my Norm Ferrar, a.k.a. The Beard Guy. If you want to watch the video, check out our uh, video YouTube channel. And we have tons of content there, not just the episode, but tons of other content. Also, if you're looking for great content, check out our newsletter at normanferrar.com or at I Know This Guy, or sorry, uh, Lunch with Norm. <laughs> Uh, I know this guy's the other podcast, but uh, Lunch with Norm, there's an area to subscribe to the newsletter. I promise you, it doesn't suck. Comes out every Monday. It's all about uh, e-com. It's not just Amazon. And Kelsey, where are you, sir? I'm here. Hello. And thank Hello. you, everyone, for watching. Yes. Um, we had lots of engagement, lots of questions for you. And yeah, Jordan, that's awesome. Or Tim. And uh, yeah, so we are an official podcast. So find us on um, Apple, Spotify, Podbean, anywhere you uh, listen to your podcast, you can find us. Um, we are on YouTube. So if you're looking for the replay, you can just go straight to YouTube. Um, just search Norm Norman Ferrar and you'll be able to find it. Um, we are doing a little bit of rebranding on some of the YouTube videos. And so you might see uh, a little bit of a different uh, different thumbnails coming up coming up soon, but uh, yeah. Oh, and about the group. Oh yes, the group. So it's coming, uh, we promise. Um, it, I'm hoping to get this up maybe this week, uh, but keep on the lookout for that. Um, maybe start thinking of some friends that you'll wanna um, add to the group as well. But uh, I'll be moderating it and Norm will come in too. Um, so you'll get both of us and yeah, we're looking to build a community should be lots of fun. Um, and we'll do some giveaways, give away some mugs. Um, yeah, should be lots a few of fun. Things. And yeah, help support Kelsey because if you don't join the group, uh, I don't pay Kelsey. Yep. So anyway, <laughs> please, <laughs> please, <laughs> please join. Yeah. Please pay Kelsey. Yeah. All right, everybody. So thank you for tuning in today. And remember every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at noon, Eastern standard time, we're live. So thank you for joining uh, the podcast today and enjoy the rest of your day. Lunch with the lunch with the lunch with the